This video describes a replica of a vintage computer I built, the Ohio Scientific Superboard II, also known as the Challenger 1P. In the fall of 1981, I bought my first computer, an Ohio Scientific Superboard II. Retailing for $279, US it was the lowest cost fully functional computer on the market, significantly less expensive than competitors like the Apple II at around US $1200. For that price you got a single board computer with no case that featured a 53 keyboard, 24 by 24 character text display with composite video out, a 1 MHz 6502 processor, 4K of RAM expandable on board to 8K, a cassette tape interface for mass storage, and Microsoft Basic and a simple machine language monitor and ROM. The tape interface could also be configured as a serial port to a monitor or printer. You needed to add a 5 volt power supply video monitor or television with RF modulator, and cassette tape recorder. If desired, you could build some kind of case. The same system was sold in a case with power supply as the Challenger 1P for $349 US. The system was expandable via an expansion connector, and Ohio Scientific offered additional boards to support more RAM and even floppy disk drives. In the UK, a clone of the Superboard 2 called the UK 101 was offered as a kit. I bought my computer on October 31st, 1981 from Archon Electronics in Toronto, Canada. With the additional 4K of RAM and taxes, it came to 486 Canadian dollars. At the time, I was a second year university student and it was a significant investment, but one that turned out to be a wise one. I built a homebrew power supply, made a case, and used a small black and white television modified for video input as a monitor. With that computer I learned BASIC and 6502 machine language programming. I wrote numerous programs including a disassembler, assembler, and some games. Within a few years the computer was replaced by an Apple IIe and later IBM compatible PCs. I had it in storage until it was damaged in a basement flood in the early 2000s and I had to throw it out. As outlined in another series of videos, in 2015 I purchased a Brielle Superboard 3, a modern replica of the Superboard 2. I had a lot of fun using this computer, which was quite faithful to the original, but used more modern hardware. In 2019 I found out that someone named Grant Kleiball had designed a reproduction of the Model 600 printed circuit board for the Superboard 2 and Challenger 1P, as well as the 610 expansion board. I ordered one each of the 600 and 610 bare boards, as well as a data separator board described later, and started a project to build up a Superboard 2 replica. The Kleiball 600 board is almost identical to the original with a few changes. Footprints for Cherry keyboard keys, wired for EEPROMs rather than masked ROMs, and support for a separate caps lock switch. There were some challenges in getting all the necessary parts, as many are no longer made, but can be found as new old stock from suppliers like Unicorn Electronics and eBay. An odd frequency crystal took some searching, but I found a crystal of the correct frequency on eBay. I was able to get a set of custom replica keycaps from someone who had them made. These fit cherry key switches, which are still available. The only issue with the keyboard is that the latching type switch used for shift lock is no longer available. The solution is adding a separate caps lock switch on the board, which the Kleiball design added support for. The BASIC and ROM uses all caps, so it's normally turned on. A version of the Superboard 2 was sold as a kit. There was a manual available which covered construction and testing. This manual was invaluable in putting my replica together. I had it commercially printed and bound and referred to it often. Once all parts were obtained, assembly was pretty straightforward. It involved a lot of soldering. I used sockets for all ICs as was done in the original. The main challenge is that the board is not solder masked, like the original, so it's easy to get shorts due to solder bridges. Even after inspecting my work carefully, I had a couple of these that took some time to track down. I was pretty excited the first time the DCWM prompt came up on the monitor and I could run BASIC. The board needs 5 volt power at considerable current, over 2 amps, for just the 600 board. A heavy duty USB adapter was adequate for just the 600 board, but I used heavy gauge wires to it. I made some modifications to my board. The caps lock switch previously mentioned, the serial cassette interface was wired as a serial port, 
and jumper set to run at a higher 9600 bit per second baud rate. A, I put a USB to serial adapter on board. This allows transferring files with a PC or even running basic from the serial port with just a USB cable. Once the 600 board was up and running, I decided to try building the 610 expansion board. This board adds 24K of RAM in addition to the 8K on the 600 board, bringing it to 32K, a 6850 UART used for the floppy disk interface, a 6820 PIA with one 8-bit port allocated to the floppy interface and another free, and a 40-pin expansion connector socket. The 610 mounts on top of the 600 board and connects via a ribbon cable. I needed to source some more new old stock parts, including the RAM, which uses 32 2114 1K by 4-bit RAM chips. Assembly was a lot of soldering. There's a real risk of having some bad parts, especially RAM, with this size board, and I had a few bad ones, but since the board can generally still function with some bad RAM, it was easier to debug. Once completed, I now had 32K of RAM. This allows running larger programs, like some C programs I had written, and could cross-compile using the CC65C compiler. The 610 board includes a floppy disk interface, but I hadn't originally planned to be so ambitious as to try to get it working. The OSI web website has forums where people had reported getting the floppy interface to work, so I thought I would give it a try. The original Ohio Scientific computers used 8-inch, yes, 8-inch, and then later 5 quarter inch referred to as mini floppy drives. It's quite hard to find 5 quarter inch drives today as they became obsolete in the mid-80s. It's easier to get 3 half inch drives. Fortunately, the 3.5 inch drives have almost the same specs as the original 8 inch drives and can be used in place of them. The other requirement was a data separator. Floppy drives require circuitry to extract clock signals from the data being read in order to recover the serial data. Modern computers use a floppy disk controller to do this, but Osaya Scientific used a proprietary scheme to store data on disk and shipped special drives that had a data separator on board. To work with sander drives, an external data separator is needed. Fortunately, that was one of the boards that I bought from Grant Clyball. It's a relatively small board that I was able to assemble. I got a used 3.5 inch drive from Kijiji. I had to make some jumper changes on the 610 board and to configure it for 8 inch floppy drives, then connect a ribbon cable and power wires to the drive. You have to calibrate the hardware by adjusting four one-shot timers on the 610 board and one on the data separator. I found manuals that covered the adjustments and used an oscilloscope to adjust the timing. I used a small standalone floppy test program that was available, although I had to make some modifications to it for 3.5 inch drives. I was eventually able to write and read some data, but with many errors. Obtaining a second 3.5 inch drive worked no better. After spending considerable time on it, I decided to set the project aside for a while. Getting back to it about a year later, my suspicion was that I didn't know if I had a good floppy drive. I bought several old PCs from a local online auction and salvaged two 3.5 inch drives from them. I carefully went through all the documentation and articles I could find to determine the one-shot timer settings for 8 inch or 3.5 inch drives. I then went through the adjustment procedure. I found I was getting reliable data transfer for part of each disk track. Then I realized that my test program was writing the incorrect amount of data. I also needed to use high density, 1.44 megabyte and not 720 kilobyte floppies. I fixed that and I was now getting 100% reliable results with all tracks. I verified this with both floppy drives that I had. Also, these are double-sided drives. Each side appears as a separate drive. I made a cable which uses a standard PC floppy crossover cable but with a few changes needed. This allows using two drives. With the double-sided 3.5 inch drives, they actually appear as four drives in total, the maximum that the computer supports. Going back to look at the two drives I had used a year earlier, one was totally dead and the other was unreliable, so the problem that was stumping me was indeed bad drives. With the 610 board and the floppies added, I needed more power than a USB adapter could support so I switched to a heavy-duty supply which could provide 5 volts with at least 5 amps. There are a few options for floppy disk software support on Ohio Scientific computers. The first challenge is how do you initially get the operating system onto disk? Fortunately, someone wrote a utility called Disk Tool that you can transfer to the computer over the serial port and run standalone. It allows you to send disk images using the X modem protocol and it writes them to disk. 
I was able to obtain disk images from the internet and write them to disk this way. Once you have a bootable disk, you can boot it using the D option of the startup screen. The primary disk operating system from Ohio Scientific was called OS65D. It supported 8 inch and 5 and a quarter inch floppies and several models including the Challenger 1P. The operating system is quite primitive but provides the following main features. A disk based version of Microsoft BASIC that supports 9 digits of precision, the ROM BASIC was 6 digits, and extended commands including support for loading and saving programs and sequential and random access data files. Command line access to the operating system with about 20 commands. An extended monitor that supports dumping memory, breakpoints, disassembly, etc. A fully functional symbolic assembler. And some utility programs for formatting and copying disks, creating, deleting, and renaming files, etc. The operating system came with a set of five tutorial disks, which included some games and example programs. Here's an example of booting one of the tutorial disks, which provides menus to select functions. Here are a couple of basic games. You can exit the menu system and go into the disk-based version of BASIC. You can also invoke the extended monitor and run some debugging commands, and we can invoke the assembler and assemble an assembly language program. As I said, the OS is quite rudimentary. Many commands are based on using disk tracks and sectors. Saving a file by name involves running several commands or programs to create a file of suitable size associating it with disk tracks and then writing it to disk. OS 65D requires 24K or more of RAM. A Superboard 2 or C1P with less RAM could not support it. Ohio Scientific offered a smaller version called PicoDOS that used ROM BASIC and could run on an 8K machine. The only disk functions supported were to load or save up to 8 BASIC programs, specifying them by number. Here's an example of booting PicoDOS and loading a program. A third-party solution was HexDOS, which was also smaller and would run on a C1P with less memory and used the ROM BASIC. However, unlike PicoDOS, it supported loading and saving programs by name and seeing a directory of programs on disk. I don't have a fully functional version of it as it only supported 5 and a quarter inch disks. Finally, DOS 65 was a third-party operating system that was inspired by and similar in use to the CPM operating system. Like CPM, it included a number of programs including an assembler and basic language interpreter. Recently, the original author has done some work to update it, but it doesn't yet look ready for widespread use. I'm still exploring the different applications I can run from OS 65D and reading manuals, documentation, and old magazine articles. In future, if I can obtain a 5 and a quarter inch drive, I may try to get that working. I also hope to try DOS 65 if disk images become available. Building a replica of my first computer was very nostalgic and satisfying. Over 40 years later, I am finally able to select that D option on the boot screen to boot from disk. Thanks go to Grant Clyball for designing his replica PCBs, the folks on the OSI web forums who provide support for old OSI computers, and the people that have archived old Ohio Scientific software and manuals.